based on the fact that you weren't used to it or, or whatever it was based on and how you when you were raising your children that you were like oh like I just didn't realize that or whatever it was like anything that ever happened with you always and I thought everything would be so different by the way you know first of all it's a big I don't know your background so you'll forgive me but raising kids if you're a Balchuba the number one thing they just throw in your face is that like you don't know because you didn't go up through the system uh, so we can't possibly understand what they're going through because we didn't grow up through the system. So that's the first issue. The second issue is I try. I, had, I certainly have tons of gaps, tons of gaps in my knowledge. So obviously sometimes I'm fighting for the right words or the right language to explain why we do what we do or why they should do a certain thing. And also I find that just because certain language resonated with me or certain ideas gave me strength to do something it's everyone's so different and so like I, like i say something that it's like life-changing for me it's like made me cry and this is, and it's like it's not like penetrating so i also find that like that's a challenge raising children in general is not easy throw in the desire to have passion and committed juice now that's next level hard with weekly episodes on our parenting hierarchy you will find the answers to your biggest parenting questions and gain the best practices you need to raise the children the way you want, to raise the Jews next door. Welcome back to another episode of The Jews Next Door. It is an absolute pleasure to be sitting with Jamie Geller, one of the real leaders of our door in so many ways. I mean, in, in Aish and as an influencer and eight, eight cookbooks. I mean, this is, uh, it's, it's incredible to, to be sitting with you and to be talking with you about raising the Jews next door. And thank you so much for taking the time. It's my absolute pleasure. I am so humbled by that intro. My, my mom will certainly be proud of that, but I, I don't even feel like uh, I'm like, that's, that's what I am, but thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. So I guess let's, let's start. Tell us a little about yourself. You mentioned your mom. Tell us a little about yourself, about your upbringing, <laughs> your life, you know. So my mom is like my best friend, by the way. She always makes it. I don't even realize this, but I, I talk about her all the time. I know. I, talk I feel to like her. I've heard you speak about her so many times. And it's, it's amazing. It's, it's a real testament to that relationship you have, which is incredible. Oh my gosh. She's going to like, just love this podcast already <laughs> just from the start. She's my number one fan. And so not just my best friend, I think it's very important to actually, like I grew up not religious. So the lines are always often very much more blurred. And I think mm -hmm. look, we have that issue all the time between parent and child. And sure. how do you become a confidant and a friend and a support, but not blur the lines where like a best friend, you obviously treat very different than a parent. So I am, as I've gotten older, trying to make sure that we have that enduring friendship, but I work working very much on my respect for her and the way that I speak to her, um, which can be a little bit too familiar sometimes. So that, that's something that I do work on. But I think that I talk about her a lot. She's my number one fan and she's my biggest for her, my husband. OK, like they like ever since I met him 19 years ago, they like fight for that spot. Um, but I think that the people that support you and love you and adore you no matter what and are always there to prop you up and always there to like get you over the hump and talk you off the ledge. Those are the people that figure prominently into your life, into your thought process and into your choices and the decisions you make in your success. And so, so that's why my mom and hubby are like regulars. And yeah, I don't know wow. where that's else we start. But so, yeah. wait, so how did that relationship with your mom develop that it was like so, so close? So first of all, my mom didn't have any sisters. She actually had a sister that died um, within a week after mm -hmm. childbirth. So um, she grew up just with one brother and she had two daughters. So I think it was the most exciting thing to her to have <laughs> that um, like female connection and that female right. energy was really, really special. So I think that I also think um, she was a stay at home mom. So I believe that that was like also a huge part in us, like spending a ton of time together and being mm. very, very close. Nice. And like, I think, uh, again, she just made it her mission to support me in every single way. And I think that that particular aspect has brought us such closeness. Like I called her not just like to get advice about things, but more often just to pray for me, you know, and just like, mom, this is happening. You need to pray. All, your your stillness work, your prayers work. And God, this is what you're praying for right now, mommy, you know? And, right, and right. I, that has translated, by the way, obviously, um, the same with my husband and my kids. And like every time before I go into a big meeting, there's a big tehillim happening like around the dinner table if I'm like out at a meeting. So it's just amazing, you know? And I think that that may be some That's of the reasons special. why we're Especially close. that like they're all part of that, of your like, your work life in that way. And like uh, in a really, you know, in a spiritual and like uh, really caring by putting out tefillah. It's, it's beautiful. Wow. It's a family business. 
Like everything we do is a family business. And I think that's the biggest gift that we can give to ourselves and to our kids to make them, if we have to work, to make them feel part of that. And I remember the first Shabbos that I was away, they sent something home to my husband and to the kids. Mm. Um, And I was like, they were so touched and I was so touched and they were like, this is the family behind the woman who's out there trying to, you know, make a change in the world. And they felt that like we've tried to instill that much that this is a family business. And even if Ima's the one who's standing out there doing something or, or Abba or, or you as one of my children, right. we're all standing behind you and we are supporting and we're doing this together. And to see that Ace recognized that. And I think that that was like one of the most beautiful things. And so, yeah, everything we do, whether it's this podcast right now is a family business. I have a daughter watching my son who's on a play date right now, you know, like they're taking care of so that I could be here with yeah. you. So totally. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Now I'll never forget. I was working in a camp and the first week that I was like working for the camp, it was a very intensive position. Um, and the director sent my wife uh, a really nice present and just said like, thank you because be- without yes. you doing everything that you're doing, we yeah. couldn't have your husband the way that we have him. And it was just like, she, my wife has told me ever since then, like that was one of the most touching things that has ever happened. Like at yes. all my, my, my whole career and everything, like that was just, it was very sweet. And she was like, like you're saying, like, we're all, the family is a part of it. So yes, completely. I love to hear that it's not just exclusive to Aish, as amazing as Aish is. I love that other you know employers and organizations are getting behind the families in that way to understand the support and the sacrifice that the entire family makes, so that wh- whoever's out there can do what they do best, do what they do best, and do what they do. Totally, totally, totally. So you mentioned in the beginning that you didn't grow up religious. So I guess, number one, it's funny, you mentioned before, like you say to your mom, like, I need your tefillos. Is that something like, at this point, maybe is she more religious? And and like, as you grew more religious, she also grew? Or is it like now it's just like as her supporting you? So I grew up in the conservative system. I went to Salman Shechter day school on the equivalent high school. So very um, connected. We went to synagogue on a regular basis. Oh, nice, we just nice. drove there. We just drove there. I knew all how to pray and everything, you know, I just so, but I didn't observe loss, but I was very much aware and traditional, let's call it very traditional. We'd love to try to have like a Friday night meal sometimes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we'd go out after, but my mom would say like Friday night, don't really go out. Like, you know, she'd love, prefer to go to the movies on Saturday night. Well, sometimes we did go Friday night, even though she preferred, but like we grew up with that idea of Shabbos and Shabbat and that kind of thing. So Um, And like I said, going to synagogue, so very much connected. And she's also been a very spiritual person always. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of her and that that desire to connect and her spirituality that drove me and my sister to like leading a more observant lifestyle and searching and going deeper. Um, So, yeah, so I think it's very much from her. Wow. When at what point in your life did you become more religious? So my, my family moved. I'm from Philly. And when I went to NYU, my family moved to Florida. And the Jewish, I guess, day school there, I don't know how they got hooked up with like more what we'll call it like an Orthodox or a modern Orthodox day school system. So my sister ended up there as opposed to like the conservative day school that we went to. So already like we got a little bit more into that world. And then um, it was not at all. When you go through the Salman Shachter day school system, you straight to college. There was not even a thought or an idea. I didn't even know you go to Israel for a gap right, year. Right. But my sister went to a school system where it's like Israel for a gap year was commonplace. So these types of things sort of started us on a particular path and journey toward more in a more observant Orthodox lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And so I would say it started from there. And I just want to give a shout out to uh, the shul uh, in Bell Harbor, uh, Rabbi Lipsker. Uh, we started going to that. It was a, it's a Chabad shul. And again, we drove there. But for the first time, we were going to an Orthodox shul that we were driving to as opposed to like right. a conservative wow. one. So hmm. and that was the beginning of our growth as so a family. So the, the move and then it's a, it's, it sounds like interestingly is actually more like your younger sister who yeah. was like the influence. That's so interesting. Yes. I feel like it's more yeah. often like the older in the family who comes back or like has like that experience and then like affects the rest of the family. But like you're yeah. saying, you and it's also like, it says something about you that you were able to be influenced and inspired by your younger sister and like the way that your family went with that. Well, she's such an influence by the way on me today. And she's so amazing and unbelievable and strong and such a paradigm of like a beautiful Jewish woman. And when I say beautiful, I, I'm not even referring to the outside. And I, um, yeah, she just happened like where we were in life, where like, like the family got exposed to this more observant Orthodox like lifestyle while I was at NYU. So I think that, yeah, she was very much impetus and also 
I'm going to go back to my mom. Uh, <laughs> she was like so nervous. I'm at NYU. And for the first time, I'm sort of outside of the Jewish bubble of like everyone. I went to, I went to Camp Ramah in the Poconos. It's a Jewish camp. I went to a Jewish day school. Like we, we right, marched right. the Israeli day parade. We went to synagogue and now I'm at NYU. And it's like, I had to seek out a Jewish social life and Jewish, Jewish friends. And she was so nervous. I'd meet the wrong guy at the wrong place. So mm-hmm. she started sending me to like these Jewish singles <laughs> events and she sent me to H New York on the Upper West Side. No, so that's I, where it all started. Like, yeah, wow. I guess 25 years ago. Yeah. For Is me. That, that's yeah. where you met your husband at Ish. Uh, not exactly. Oh, it's a longer like, that'd story. Be crazy if it came full circle like that. <laughs> so much for me and my spiritual and personal growth journey and professionally came full circle with Ish. And I can tell you more about that in a minute, but it was um, through Ish and then through a discovery seminar that I decided to start keeping Shabbos. And then oh, of wow. course, when the time was right, then I went to a shotgun and then I met my husband through a shotgun. Oh, so, wow. That is crazy. Wow. 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 Yeah. The, the full circleness of that is, is it's really yeah. crazy. Yeah. Wow. Aish has always been doing amazing work and Baruch Hashem, they have you now to help them do even more incredible work and let the world know more about it as well. It's so humbling because just one other little point I'll share with you is that once I decided I was going to quit my job at HBO and I'm going to, I, I wrote a cookbook and I want to get the word out there about my book. And so I decided, I always say you could take the girl out of TV, but you can't <laughs> take the TV out of the girl. So I decided <laughs> I'm going to make cook. I'm going to make cooking videos to start promoting this book. At the time there were no like, you know, kosher Jewish cooking videos. And I make these videos. You were, and, like, you were the first one, like straight up the first one. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> it was, it was, like, was fun. It was a long time ago. And so I make these videos and I'm like, nobody knows me. I have nowhere to put these videos. What am I going to do with them? If I just throw them on YouTube, no one will see them. So I called up H.com and I said, you're the number one Jewish website in the world. I have these free videos. I will give you free, amazing content. Can you just put it out there? And they did. And so like, not just for my personal growth 25 years ago, but professionally, my start in the digital world was at H.com. That is incredible. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. So, and then I guess, and what inspired you at some point to make Aliyah? Was that H or was that before H? So that, that was um, before Aish, uh, when I met my husband on the first date, he said, I'd like to move to Israel. And I was like, you know, go find yourself another girl. Because, <laughs> you know, I love Israel, visit Israel, support Israel, but I'm not living in Israel. Right, right. And I always say like water on a rock. He worked on me. And uh, by the time we had five children, we were married, I guess, eight years. Oh, wow, we made wow. Aliyah. Yeah, but he wow. really worked for eight years. And I felt so much that his desire to live in Israel was from such a, a truthful, soulful place. And not, you know, it wasn't like, oh, we need to move here to this place where I have a bigger house. I'm going to get a better job. I'm going to make more money. Mm -hmm. It's like, we need to go home. We need to move to Israel. That's the place for us. And so we went with, we fought along, but so typical me. I'm like, okay, well, if I'm going to do it, we're going to make a splash and we're going to make a documentary (laughs) about it. And so I called up Nefesh Nefesh and I said, oh, by the way, I'm making Aliyah. I haven't seen any documentaries about like what it's like to make Aliyah. I've read all these amazing books and these amazing blogs. And like, as I tried to prepare myself, but like, obviously we know how people learn. They're so visual. We all love video entertainment, streaming content. And so I was like, let's make a real time documentary. At the time, my website was called Joy of Kosher. Now it's called Mm -hmm. jamiegeller.com. But we did a play on Joy of Kosher and uh, we made Joy of Alia and we did a 10 part oh, real time documentary series. I part did it because I love TV. I love producing, like I said, and I felt it was necessary and the world needed it. But I also felt like if I did that, then I couldn't back out. Because you know? <laughs> we had for a few years, I, I put my house on the market. I said bye to all my kids' teachers, and they're like, "Go to Israel, you're going to be amazing. You're making us proud." We cried, and then the year would start again, and I would be back in school, and they'd be like, "What happened?" I had cold feet a few times in a row. I had cold oh, feet. Really? Actually, oh, yes, wow, wow, yes. Wow. Our house was on the market a few times. A few years, I said goodbye oh, to everyone wow. and the teachers, and there we were back. You know, first day of school. So here I was like, if I do this, like, ain't no turning back. So wow. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's incredible. What was that like for your children? And what was it like parenting children through the Aliyah process? I don't know. I'm sorry to say I never saw the the documentary. I'm sure that that was like part of it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I am going to tell you such a funny story that happened to me today. So I I went to a bris of a dear friend and walking back to my car and someone's like chasing me down the street. And literally, there's no one else on the street. She's calling me, Jamie, Jamie, Jamie. And I'm turning around, I'm looking. She's running toward me. And I was like, I know this woman. I'm not sure. I don't think I know her. Maybe she looks familiar. You know, like at one point, you're like, everyone looks familiar. She's like, right. you don't know me, but. 
And she tells me her story. And she says they made Aliyah from Muncie seven years ago. And to prepare for it, and I've heard this many times from people, They not only did they watch the documentary, but they sat their children down so their mm. children would know what to expect. And she said in one scene of the docu, which you haven't seen yet, so I'll tell you. I like, I say goodbye to my house and the lights dim and I like, I'm like goodbye home and I lock the door and the music stops and you can, you hear the door lock and you hear the sound of silence. It's just like peaceful, emotional moment of like, goodbye America, you know? And so she said she did that and they get in the car and they're on their way to the, um, you know, to the airport. And she's like, she thinks she's wearing one flip flop and her shade goes sideways. And the how the, like the front lawn is strewn with like all the things they left behind that they couldn't fit. And she says, one of her kids says to her, mom, that's not how it looked when J.B. Geller said goodbye to her house and made Aliyah. You know, that's so it's right. like, oh, you know, it's different for everyone. And right. obviously parenting them through it, they were younger. It depends what age your kids are. It depends right. their personalities. It depends your personality. My husband is the type of like, everything was color coded and, and like done. Like I get a lot of like props because of how organized I am. It's really him. You know, right. I'm, just the, I'm just the front woman. So right. yeah, it, but it was definitely an experience and even more so it's amazing to have these home videos to look back on because a lot of the kids don't even remember it. They really? were so how, young. How old was your oldest? My oldest just turned seven. My oh, youngest wasn't wow. even six. My youngest wow. doesn't remember it. Everyone else was younger, like right. three and younger. So it's like, their memories, their only memories are this video now. Sure, sure. If you're looking for a great way to have some good, clean, kosher fun with your children through the powerful effect of music, look no further because Jay Karaoke is here. Jay Karaoke gives one and all the platform to belt out their favorite tunes from a library of thousands of Jewish songs, hundreds of artists, and genres across multiple decades of incredible Jewish music. Personally, I know that I love singing. I love it. I love karaoke, but I was really never able to get into it because it wasn't the Jewish songs. And that's where J Karaoke comes in with their huge selection from the latest hits to the classics. They even have nursery rhymes for your little ones. And with features like key changes to help you sing, to make you more comfortable as you're singing and speeding it up or slowing down the song, they have really thought of everything. To enjoy Jewish karaoke your way, all you need to do is head to jkaraoke.com. Choose a subscription that fits for you. And to make it even more fun, you could purchase their state of art karaoke kit, which gives you the feeling as if you are today's top singer. You can insert whoever you feel it is. Connect your kit to any device, like it could be a laptop, a computer, a tablet, whatever it is. And you plug in your speaker, plug in your J karaoke microphone, and you sing away. It's as easy as that. That's all it is. And it's really fun. I checked out their website. Really looks amazing. They have an incredible, incredible amount of song selection. Anything you want. They got Thank You Hashem. They got Mordechai Shapiro. They really got it all. You can subscribe monthly for just $4.99 a month, yearly for $49.99. And we have a special deal here for you. For any of our listeners, if you use the code JewsNextDoor, D O R, you get an additional 10% off. And if you don't want your children to be using a device with internet, J Karaoke has got you covered. You can download the app onto your desktop. Once you have it up, turn off the internet. Let them sing all day long without the internet. Check out Jay Karaoke today and let the fun begin. Well, any advice that you would give for a parent who is maybe in that process of considering Aliyah or who just did and you know, now it's like that adjustment period or with young for children anyone, or even older children, I guess. Yeah. So for anyone who's considering it, my advice is to seek Das Torah, to always make the decision with your rabbi and with rabbinical mm-hmm. counsel and with advice, period. And no one else is, you know, set and suited to to like to give your family this type of life changing, you know, right. um, direction. And so very much with like, you know, rabbi that you're very close with for anyone who's here now. So that advice is just hang on. You know, it's like life. It's just <laughs> I think it's everything with parenting, with teenagers at home, with like Aliyah, with like, it's just hang on and thank Hashem in the midst of all of the challenges and the scary things that we go through and the things that we think we're not going to be able to, to overcome and like that just seem insurmountable. We just need to dive into Hashem and we need to always say thank you and look at all of the things that we have to say thank you for. I know that any of these challenges could have come anywhere. And if it wasn't these, these exact challenges wrapped in this particular package with this particular bow, you're thinking, oh, only in Israel or only, we would have other ones somewhere else, you know, whether it be Nevada or Philadelphia. So, you know, like that's my advice. Totally. It's a very, very, very good point. I'm curious, you know, going back a little bit to what we were talking about before in terms of, you know, your upbringing and your religious upbringing, have you found ever as you're bringing up your own children 
that there are things that let's say either that there are gaps in your knowledge or things that were challenging based on the fact that you weren't used to it or, or whatever it was based on, on how you, when you were raising your children, that you were like, oh, like I just didn't realize that or whatever it was like anything that ever happened with you? Always. And I thought everything would be so different, by the way. You know, first of all, it's a big, I don't know your background, so you'll forgive me, but raising kids, if you're a Balchuba, the number one thing they just throw in your face is that like, you don't know because you didn't go up through the system. Uh, so we can't possibly understand what they're going through because we didn't grow up through the system. So that's the first issue. The second issue is I try, I, had, I certainly have tons of gaps tons of gaps in my knowledge. So obviously sometimes I'm fighting for the right words or the right language to explain why we do what we do or why they should do a certain thing. And also I find that just because certain language resonated with me or certain ideas gave me strength to do something, it's everyone's so different. And so like, I, like I say something that it's like life-changing for me. It's like made me cry. And this is, it's like, it's not like penetrating. So I also find that like, that's a challenge I read in a recent um, book that like we need siyata deshmaya, we need divine intervention to when it comes to chinuch and education with our children to speak to our kids in the moment and tell them exactly what they need to hear because mm. what we think they need to hear, what we think yeah. will help them, might not be. You know, so, so yeah, it's so challenging. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Would you say that are there specific areas or things that you remember that were like? that was hard because I didn't have that type of upbringing or you don't like not any specifics? I think without going into too many specifics, but any time that the kids want to deviate from what is sort of the expected norms of the framework in which we're bringing them up with, mm. it's like, I can't believe it. I, it's like, it's shocking to me each time. It's right. like, you grew up like this, like this is how we've raised you in this particular framework. And to see them wanting to, try something different or be a little bit more lax in something right. um, is so challenging to watch. And it's so challenging. Yeah. So whether it comes to certain, like whether it's certain types of dress codes mm -hmm. or certain types of way of, you know, dealing with like the daily prayers. So I'm just saying when it comes to certain, you know, dress codes, like I said, or, or davening and minion and, and just the way that we treat shul or how, how we're the Shabbos with the way that we dress, all these things like, there's so many nuances in there and I didn't mm. things that I didn't think would be a struggle. If you grow up a certain way, I'm finding mm. still there is a certain level of flexibility and growth that people need to experience themselves, even with the support of a community and a, and a school and a shul and a framework. So that's yeah, been yeah. a hard and surprising. Well, I think sometimes people say it's like the opposite in terms of like a Baal or a Baal mm. who like didn't have that experience. And when they're first experiencing and they're so inspired, it's like, Wow. Like, and, and like you said, there are certain things that will inspire you that won't inspire someone else, but as opposed to someone who's grown up with it their whole, whole life. So in a way, like we take it for granted, but at the, at the same time, sometimes it just doesn't have it. Unfortunately, we, and as, as the, chinuch, you know, and, and education system needs to sometimes do a little bit of a better job in terms of getting them to be just as excited about it as, as if it was something that was more new. Yeah, correct. It's a different when and we've electively chosen this as a Balchuva and each thing that we were introduced to was mind blowing as opposed right. to like, as you said, being born into it and it being literally like, just like a reflex, like a rote, like routine, you know, like brushing our teeth. Okay. We brush our teeth and we put on to villain, you know, it's like, I'm surprised. And, you know, it's hard to talk about the Chinuch system because I do hear that people want to point a finger and they want more from the system. And I think we want more, but I don't know. I think it also is us. We need to figure out as parents and as a community, as a shul, what more we could do as well. And it's such a partnership. It takes a village. It takes a town. It takes a city. It takes a world of support. And I think that we all could be doing better. And, and there, you know, I feel... You know, I'm looking inward first before pointing the finger. I totally agree. I totally agree. hundred percent. And I, I'm curious, you know, as someone who, who themselves went through that experience of being inspired and being wowed by different things, do you have a different perspective, I guess, when you are, let's say, talking to your children? Are there, are there pieces of advice that you would give based off of coming from that, like different perspective that as to how we can try as, you know, like you said, looking inwards first, like for parents, as opposed to looking, pointing the finger at, you know, the education system for parents to be able to best, you know, inspire and raise their children that way? I think what I'm learning the very painful way is that teenagers are teenagers no matter what. 
no matter what city, what time zone, what culture, what state, what what religion, what what sect of religion. And that the parent, the feeling in general of most teenagers is that the parents, despite the wisdom that we have to offer and the experiences, it's like they need to sometimes figure it out on their own. And as much as we try, and, and, and by the way, my, you know, my husband and I, we keep saying it. We keep saying what we have to say because we know, like, again, like I talked about water on a rock before, it will penetrate and they'll hear it and hopefully they'll heal the words and they'll see our face at the right times, like when, when they're confronted with challenges. But, you know, teenagers... So with, there's that feeling of invincibility, of I know, of you're from the olden days, you're from the, mm-hmm. another country, you're from another place, right. like, you know. <laughs> and so as much as we try, and I, I don't think that should stop us from continuing to talk and to say what we need to say, but to understand that, unfortunately, they're going to have to go through a little bit of finding themselves and like, and, and learning it for themselves. They can't just be told, and like, it's like, oh, I'm just going to follow. And totally. look, Judaism and Yiddishkeit is about... Um, being an independent thinker, right? And like, and challenging and wanting, how do we get grown our Amuna? How do we grow our Bitachon? How do we grow our Tefillah? How do we grow our Vodas Hashem? How do we grow our Dvekis? It's all about pushing and thinking. And so we want the, it's like, we want them to like fall in line, yet we want them to also be the, you know, so we had, how do we nurture both of that as, as they totally. grow? Totally. It's true. I mean, developmentally, a teen is going through a time when they are starting to remove themselves a little bit from the parents. And are trying to, you know, be a little more connected with friends. And, and like you said, they're, they're just trying to find themselves. And so, you know, like, like you said, it's, it's about still being there for them. And it's that, it's that relationship with them. That's, that's the key. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. That, I think that that's the most critical thing that we're working on is that. And like I said, the way that I feel about my mom and my dad too, by the way, I called him up yesterday and I was like, happy father's day. And he's like, it was yesterday. <laughs> I called him, I called him two days ago before, by the way. And I, I said, you know what, but. I said, Daddy, I, I said to him, in the firm world, we try to tell each other, we don't celebrate Father's Day because it's Father's Day every day. Well, then sure. I'm going to call you every day and say, happy Father's Day. I'm going to call you to say, I love you and I appreciate you. And like, right. even when it's not, you know, the, the second Sunday in June. And so, and I think that that relationship is the most critical to pushing through, um, you know, these times. So Totally, totally. And I've, I've heard you speak about it in the past about how, you know, your parents were divorced and they separated a couple of times. How did that affect you as a, as a child? Look, it's, it was so, so, so challenging. I think for kids, one of the most important things is like stability and the safety of home and the safety mm-hmm. of that, those relationships to be themselves and to know that when all else feels like it's falling out from underneath them, you know, like their parents and their home are, are like that safe space and that stable space. And so um, certainly that was like so, so challenging. And I think it affects your relationships and how you act socially and act out socially. Yeah, it was a hard time. It was definitely, yeah. definitely hard. And it happened all throughout, even senior year, they got separated again. And then by the time I graduated um, a college, they were going through a divorce. Got so it. that's their second divorce right. oh, wow. <laughs> from each wow. other, from each other. Yeah. Wow. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, they, they were married to each other twice. So yeah, I, but you know, I remember like, like seeing them fight and saying, you know, is daddy going to move out again? Are you going to leave again? And, and I see that with my kids too, like where we've given no indication that God forbid times that that would be the case. But like you see your parents fight and I've seen my little kids be like, you know, what's going to happen? Because they have friends who do have parents who are divorced. Are you going to get divorced from like, you know, just a normal fight? And like, which, and I try to normalize that like so much, like sometimes we disagree, but we're always going to work it out and we're going to be here for you. And like right, to just right. reassure that that sort of stability that they need. It feels like you, you have that sensitivity because of the fact that you, you know, you had that and it mm-hmm. happened to you in your life. So like you can, you know that how it affects a child. So therefore like yeah. you're, you're approaching it with such a different approach, which is, which is so healthy and amazing for your children. Yeah. You know, I think divorce is so much more commonplace now that it's like not given as much thought about what the ramifications are on, on children for life, by the way. Like every simcha now depends. Some people can divorce more amicably and a call a to them. And co-parenting is now like a definitely a new uh, thing, but it wasn't, it wasn't then when I was growing up. So now like my parents are divorced 22 years and like still for the bat mitzvah for my daughter coming up, we're going to have to choose one or the other to be there. They can't both be there, you know, and those, those things are painful. 
You know, it's like, it's like generational, you know, it, we're still dealing with it, generational issues. And so, yeah, it's just, you know, they just, it, when it comes, becomes more commonplace, people don't think about the ramifications and yeah, they're still so there. True. So true. So true. Wow. In terms of, you know, your, before your amazing role at, uh, at Aish, so you were, you were this incredible influencer. Like I said before, you were like, you were the first one, you were the first one to make these videos and, you know, really one of the first to like really create cookbooks and one of the first Jewish influencers, especially. So I'm, I'm curious, I mean, it, it, it seems like based on the way you described it, it may, it may have been when your children were younger, but did it have any effect on your home? And, and if it, if it didn't, then I guess, how did you make sure it didn't have an effect on your home? My children were much younger and also at the beginning of it all, you didn't have to show your family as much in order to be relevant. And now it's all about like how authentic can we be and how much can we show, how much can we expose ourselves and our, and those, our loved ones around and those that show more of their life, people connect to them more. And so therefore they get more relevancy and more success. So my kids were much younger. So thank God it didn't, it wasn't like about, it wasn't like the Jamie and kids show. It was you know, the Jamie show. And I, that was a decision I made for myself. And by the way, when it first started happening, like I didn't even, I just thought I'm making cooking videos. Like I didn't know, like you also might want to know like what I think on a random Tuesday, you right. know what I'm saying? If something happens in the world that what I might have, have to comment on it. <laughs> yeah, correct. Correct. Like, and if something happened to what, like that, I have to comment on it. Like suddenly, like I have to comment on world affairs and politics and like really deep things. And that's not what I got into. And it's not what I signed up for. And the more and more that became the reality, the less and less comfortable I stopped feeling. I, I started feeling with this role as an influencer. And that was one of the reasons why I took a step back and wanted to, you know, do something different with my life. And that's one of the reasons why I ended up at H. Wow. wow, wow. Oh, wow. Very cool. But now you still have like this incredible platform on, on Instagram on multiple accounts. So how do you, you know, how do you, I guess have that balance where you, your children are like, I've seen, I've seen that your children are in the post and you have like the perm, yeah. you know, costumes, which are <laughs> very creative by the way. Yeah. And you know, how do you, how do you have that balance where it's not affecting them in a way? So first of all, I thank Tashem for everything because everything has gotten me to this moment. And on one hand, I, I do struggle with like, I should just turn it off. It's like, it would be so much more be better for my mental health. But on right. the other hand, not only has it been beneficial to Aish and led me to Aish, but we've also like, Last year, we raised almost $600,000 to support our farmers for the Shemitah yeah, year. I and I work with uh, Yad Ezra Vashula Meat. And I work with Daily Giving. And I work with Mayor Panim. And it's been a tremendous platform to raise awareness um, for the organizations that, you know, make the Jewish world go round and that we need. So I'm trying to focus on all of the positives that it brings and trying the best I can to safeguard myself from the challenges that being on social, you know, can, um, the challenges that, that can arise. And so I do have some safeguards. I generally, unless it's like a family simcha, so like a bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, I generally don't put the entire family on and I, and I don't put my teenagers on. Like again, if there's a family simcha picture, so I will share like happy, happy bar mitzvah to my son, AY, and I'll share a family picture. Um, but otherwise my teenagers are not on once they get into high school. I don't put them you know, on camera and I keep it again, the Purim costume. So I did with my younger kids cause it's cute and fun. Is that something that they, they ever like voiced to you that the teens like didn't want to be on or that was something that you or you and your husband chose specifically? The teens want to be on. Well, they want to be on. <laughs> yes, totally. They're yeah, like, you know. Well, I mean, I yeah. always do it. My mom was like, Jamie Geller, who's like, I mean, like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, they want it. They like, yeah, they think it's cool and they want to be on, but it's just a decision I made. And the little kids, it, like, everyone likes it. So they're never like, no. So, um, right, right. but I do, it's it's like, if anyone was like, I don't want the kid, I would never, ever do that to my kids. And even so, it's few and far between. And even so, I get concerned about like overexposure. Um, but I do feel, like I said, that sometimes when you share a part of your life, you share a little bit of your family or a little bit of insight into what you're thinking or what you're doing or where you're going. So it creates a connection with the um, people that then you can use if, they, if it can then be used. If it's there just to further myself and my personal business and to sell like more advertising, I, I, I couldn't handle it anymore. But if it's there to help raise money for Jewish organizations and people feel more connected to so that when I when I do say, OK, we're raising money for Holocaust survivors now who do not have what to eat for Pesach, if not for you. And then we can raise a few tens of thousands of dollars to help do that. So then it's a little bit of let's call it it is a price to pay 
to be a little, to expose yourself a little bit more and be a little bit more vulnerable with yourself and with your family. But I, I'm kind of trying to look at the, um, the, the, the goal. And if the goal feels right and altruistic, and this so far still feels in, into the degree that I do it feels okay. So then I'm going to keep, and if it ever doesn't, I'll stop that part too. That's great. And in terms of like, just in terms of the, time you spend on social media, like, and meaning like that means, which comes along with being on our phones, which is something I feel like, you know, not every parent is a social media influencer, but every parent, not every parent, but a lot of parents are on their phones. So what, what, how, what advice or what safeguards, like you said, do you put into place to make sure that it's not too much phone time and not too much, you know, social media time. That way you're still being present with your family. That's like so hard. I tried at various points in my life and still try now not to bring my phone with me when I'm with the kids. Like I work, but I work. So it's very hard for someone who's with the kids all the time. Cause then it's like, <laughs> how are you going to like run your life? Cause I mean, every single like after school activity and carpool and this and that and homework for the kids is only a million like WhatsApp groups from like parenting, you know, oh. <laughs> like, so it's hard. But, but for me, because I, I do work and I do have an office and I do go, you know, God, so I try, try, try like dinner time, bedtime, like not to bring my phone out with me at all. Like I keep it charging in my room or my office or whatever. Now I can't always do that. If my husband's out and he's shopping for me, he'll get really, it will be really hard for him to shop for me for Shabbos if he's got a question when he's in the aisle. So then what I'll do is I'll put the ringer on so I could hear it, but I'll put it in a drawer or in a cabinet. So I'm not holding it and I'm not distracted by it. But if it rings, who really calls anymore? Only my husband, right? Like no one's, my mom, my mom. No one's <laughs> calling. Everyone's just texting, WhatsApping, whatever, you know? So if it rings then I know it's like, it's something that was important. And I, as I try to limit that time that when I'm with them to make sure it's really, really focused and quality is to do that. And you know, like I don't want my kids to have smartphones or maybe when they're, when they're older, I like, you know, maybe a kosher smartphone if they need it for business. You know, sure. and so if I'm not, if I'm modeling this, then there's no way that I could have a hope for them to not do the same. And I don't, yeah. I, I don't want to Very ever true. be speaking to them and they're doing that. So how could I do that to them? You know? Yeah. So true. So true. And I guess another component of being, uh, you know, an influencer and on social media and with Asian, all these different components is that you have this very, in, in a way, even though, you know, like you said, you, certain things you choose to share and certain things you choose not to, but you have somewhat of an open life. So how do you maintain and I guess role model for your, for your children, the concept of modesty while doing that? That's the hardest. Modesty is like so beyond just dress. And that's hard in and of itself, by the way, right? Figuring that out and navigating that for women is just such a challenge, but it's also in behavior. And that is like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm successful. <laughs> I happen to, in general, have like a very warm personality. And that's been mm -hmm. something I always like, how do I, how do I balance that in terms of modesty? And like, I'm the type, like before I would hug and kiss everyone I met, like just love you all. <laughs> so now I'm like, I'm hugging and kissing all the ladies, you know, right, like, right. I meet you once and someone's like, oh, I love you. But yeah, it's so hard. It's so hard. And especially when it comes to things like, I don't know. I'm a little bit of a loss because it's, it's not a simple thing to navigate. And I think that every yeah. single day I need to do a assessment of like, did I cross the line? Did I go too far? Was that appropriate? You know, mm -hmm. would, would I want my girls to do this? Like, would I want my, like, would I feel comfortable if they were seeing this? Like, this is something that my husband would be proud of. And like, you have to start, just have these sort of questions that you ask yourself to keep to be able to express yourself in the way that's so naturally you, but at the same time to make sure that it feels in line with your core principles and beliefs. And so it is an everyday nuanced navigation of that, of that area. Totally. Totally. So as, as a foodie and as like the, one of the first ever kosher and Jewish foodies. So what's that like, I guess, first things first in terms of like in your home, in terms of like the food in your home, in terms of how you raise your children with food choices? Like what, what, what does that look like? Okay. So first of all, I always say, um, I don't like cooking. <laughs> like I tell everyone that I wrote about so that funny. in all of my books. And I always <laughs> say like, like I'm not into slaving in the kitchen. Slavery is like, so yesterday, you know, the whole idea of quick and kosher recipes from the bride who nothing, who knew nothing, which was the first book. It's all about how do you get in and out of the kitchen as quick as possible. So to me, I love food. I love eating. I love entertaining, but really like food is about to me, bringing us together around the table. 
And the, mo- and the most important thing is the moments that happen around the table. So it's, it's a means to an end. And cooking with my kids, like, love that. But also, like, it's not about the food as much as it is the relationship right, with them, right, you know? Right, right. Like, and, like, cooking with them and, like, and those memories, they're so yummy and that's so homey. That's, like, to me, like, the ultimate thing of cooking with my kids. Um, and when it comes to food choices, we're super duper obsessed with having them try everything 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 from as young of an age as possible i feed table food and mush it mush it up as much as i can and don't make or cook specifically different for for different kids but even so i have one a crazy picky eater like they don't even like french fries like what kid doesn't like french fries wow, like no that potatoes is, that is yeah, no, <laughs> no potato kugel no french it's like hashem help me so like even with all of these fabulous tips that I used to say when I was much younger, like get, give them table food, don't cook separate for them, don't cater or coddle. And I've got one of these like, I, you know, eat only red foods type of thing. So, <laughs> you know, it is, so yeah, but the most that we can do to like get them in the kitchen with us and give them the confidence. Like I never want anyone to feel like I did like lost and alone and scared in the kitchen and, uh, and cooking with us and trying as much as we can and being experimental. Yeah, we just go for it. In terms of, you know, like you were saying that you get, you got them to all try everything. How did you, how do you do that? That in itself seems like this incredible feat. (laughs) So first of all, like I said, like the moment before they can even speak, but they're eating table food. So I'll take what we're eating and I'll mush it, you know, down so that like their palate is already starts. We're training. Okay. We're training uh, the palate at a young age to just try different things and different textures and flavors and avocado and oh gosh. My husband, when I had my first baby, he mushed down gefilte fish. I was like, ew, that is the grossest thing ever. And I don't want my gorgeous baby who's supposed to smell like baby powder and baby lotion and like utter freshness smelling oh, like God. a gefilte fish. And he's like, he was like, no, he insisted that we like have a Hamish baby and just ask her gefilte like, fish. I'm like, ah. So we, do, we tried it, it all. Of these, uh, these Manischewitz, um, what's called the gefilte fish, like pops and the hot dogs. God. Have you seen these? I don't know if you've seen these. <laughs> That's what, that's what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> so totally, 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 uh, totally. So yeah, so we just started at a young age and like what we eat, it's, it's giving to them and to just talk about, just try it. And we say, if you don't like it, you never have to eat it again, but just try it. This way you'll know you might open a world to like, oh my gosh, I love this. And I never knew. And I have most of my kids like love fish and all different kinds of fish, which is usually not just tuna, not just salmon and not just gefilte, you know? And it's like, that's just amazing. Like I'm, I'm proud of that. I love that. Yeah, and they give everything a try. That's awesome. As a foodie, how do you think parents in general, besides for just getting them to try everything at a young age, how can parents help their children to make good food choices? Well, I think also getting them in the kitchen with you that creates like empowers them. Like good food choices usually happen. I mean, look, there's so many great products on the shelves right now, but when we make the food ourselves, right? Like then we start to understand like what's natural, what's clean, what's good, what's healthy, what's full of protein, what is a carb, what's a good carb, all these types of things. And like the more that you understand that, so the better not only can you make the choices when you're like on the go and need to grab, you know, pre-made food, but like if you're empowered to then go ahead and make things for yourself in the kitchen and, and be creative there, I think that that's amazing. Mm, That's a great point. That's a really great point. So as we wrap up, I'm curious, you know, what are, what would you say are some of the best or some of your favorite parenting tips or piece of advice that you've ever heard or, or things that you yourself would give as parenting tips or advice? I'm going to give you one that I need to give myself right now, which everyone is saying. And, um, Rav Gershon Edelstein Zetzal passed Mm -hmm. recently. You have to just love them even when they're doing things that are just like so hard to understand what and why and you know but love 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 and like safeguard the relationship and make sure the channels are open so that not only can you talk but they feel that they can come to you with anything and they're never they never did anything that's too too embarrassing or too that Mm -hmm. they're too ashamed of or that you know and like Look, it's like you see they're so nervous to t- like tell you something and they maybe they'll lie because they're covering something up. It's like you're not even going to be upset about it. It's like, you know, or, or you understand that it's a, like a small struggle and we'll get through it. But like it's something just so so happened that like snowball for us and our family, just something. It's like we're here. We can help you with that. Like to let them know I love you the most. There's no one else that loves you more. There's no one here that wants to help you more. And there's no one. I'm here. Nothing. There's nothing you can tell me that I won't be here to help you and support you with. That's so true. Separating the child from the action is so incredibly important during right. those times to be able to really Completely. say, I, I know that you're going through a struggle, but that's, it's a struggle. It's, it's a challenge. Yeah. It's not you. You're, you are a person that I love so much. 
with with no conditions, no strings attached. I, uh, it's, it's a very powerful idea. And, and I on. believe in you like that too, because sometimes mm. the love is one thing, yeah. but I believe in you, you know, and I, I you know, we have, there's this amazing book. It was put out by um, the Between Carpools um, group of ladies. I don't know if you know that brand. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I can't even remember what the book is called, but I bought it in the local Judaica store. And it's like questions that you can go through with your kids and you can like, yeah, what's your favorite food? What was your best memory? What, if, if you were president, what would you, what well, one law would you change? All these fun things that spark conversation. And so like, I've been doing that with my younger kids and you know, what's your fa- three favorite things about yourself? And one of my kids, again, I won't say which one was like, I have nothing good to say about myself. What could like, I was like, what? so now I make a habit of this is good about you. And this is good about you. And, and you did this, recognize this, like to see like all these small things that they do on a daily basis that like, they recognize like for them to love themselves. So giving them confidence and letting them know that you believe in them no matter what, no matter what. And, and you said something so pointy it's separating the action from the child and understanding what is the core issue that propelled this action. And then let's help you with that. You know, like, totally. so totally, such an avoda. Totally. Yeah. Parenting is, is, is amazing. And at the same time, it's, it's challenging. It's uh, it's really challenging, but it's, it's the best. It's the, it's the best thing ever. And it's like this, like you were saying before, like Hashem has given us these children and it's, it's this amazing thing. And that comes with both the most incredible, gratifying moments and the most meaningful moments in our lives. And at the same time, it comes with real challenges. Yeah. It's so humbling. I like, I feel like now with like, we have four teenagers in the house <laughs> or, um, <Wow. laughs> yeah, yeah, it's four. And I feel like now I'm, I'm calling my parents more and being like, I love you more. That's why, like, yeah. that's why I'm saying every day is father's day right now, because it's like, I, you know, it is so humbling. I think of that it's important. Yeah. And I, oh, I got one other piece of advice that I want to share um, is that somebody said that whatever you see your child struggling with or your children struggling with, it's really a mirror reflection. It's indicative of something that you have to work on yourself. Mm. And mm. instead of trying to change them and change that thing, try to refine that and change that in yourself and grow in that area yourself. And God mm. willing, you know, the blessings will come. So true. Being a parent is the greatest Moser Sater or safer that you, that there can be because it literally it's like it shows you like oh you're having a hard time with that that's clearly because it's a hundred percent and at one point one of my kids again I won't say who but like they say so much like this one looks like you and this one looks like you and all the carbon copy and this and that obviously they got a lot of other cojos and powerful tools and strength with that as well but some of the most challenging things are the most powerful tools that will serve you, you know, in life. And I think every teacher has ever said to me, it's going to be hard, but they're going to be the future leaders. It's like, okay, well, how do we get through this in the next, you know, 15 <laughs> right. years? But, it's you know. It's like when someone says like, oh yeah, that child who's very stubborn, like that stubbornness is going to lead them to be, yeah. but like right now they're really stubborn and it's correct, hard. And, correct, it's, and it's okay. And it's normal to, for it correct, to be challenging. Correct, correct. Totally. As we, as we wrap up, any, any final messages besides for those great tips that you just mentioned? No, I guess I just think that like every single day that we wake up means that our, we still have a goal to accomplish. We are mm-hmm. here because uniquely, not only is the Jewish soul unique, but obviously every one of us is so unique. And we've been just both ourselves and the souls that we've been entrusted to raise and to grow. Uh, I think Rabbi Olavsky said this, you're not raising good kids, you're raising good adults. And so every day we wake up, my husband said, I don't know if you'll get this reference, Groundhog Day. Did you ever see mm, that movie? Sure, sure. It's like, <laughs> it feels like we are not making any advancement. Every day is the same day. And I'm back here in the tub. So it's like, is this a joke? You know, um, but we are here another day to fight another day in order to, to create change in ourselves, in our children, in our families, in the world, positive change. We have work to do and to be empowered by that and to, to seize it, to seize the moment, to seize the day and to see it as a gift. Mm, I love that. I love the Groundhog Day reference. It is so relatable of, it just feels like, Every day, it's another day. Another, it's so relatable. It's so relatable. <laughs> Didn't we talk about this yesterday? Because here we are again <laughs> now. And like, why is the morning so hard? You know, like getting kids off to school should not be this difficult. But it's like we do it every day. Again. We should have yeah. it done in this book. But no. it wouldn't get it out. It's like not getting better. No, it's just the same. Yeah. So true. So true. Wow. Thank you so much. There was so many incredible points of real wisdom, inspiration here. And your life, your life is in, is an inspiration. It's really, it's incredible. Uh, you're, you're clearly such a growth oriented person who like, 
you, you weren't religious growing up and yet you went and you took it and, and the fact that you're raising a religious family in Israel and doing everything you're doing with Aish and on your social media, it's, it's incredible. It's really, truly an inspiration. And I really thank you so much for your time. Instead of all of the accolades, can you give me a bracha? Me? Oh, seriously, bracha. yes. I yes. want you to give me a bracha. No, no, I want one from you. I need, I need like koach is a strength and not like accolades. I need, give me a good bracha. Well, I'll definitely say that it's it, it, at parenting as, as you were mentioning and I, and alluding to that there's challenges all, all the time. So I give you the bracha to be able to handle all of those with the grace that you've handled everything else with and to to, to just really continue doing an amazing job for the way, the way you're doing an amazing job for Claudia's role to be able to continue to do that with your home as well. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Jews Next Door. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. I'd love to hear your takeaways. Reach out to us. Reach out to me at yair at jenoff.org. Hi at jenoff.org. You can check us out on the website. You could leave a question there. We'd love to be in touch. Please be in touch. Check us out on Instagram at Parenting the Jews Next Door. Hit me up on Twitter at Yair Manchel. And we got, we're on TikTok now too. We have some great content, a lot of really great insights into parenting, tips, parenting pointers, reaction videos, and quotes. We have a lot going on. We have a lot of articles. You want to check it out. Check it out at jenoff.org. You won't be sorry you did. And I look forward to hearing from you. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, make sure you subscribe and share it with your family and friends. Looking forward to another great episode next week.